Greetings. Um, another episode of On the Porch with Pastors coming up. <laughs> We're glad to have you again this evening. It's uh, overcast. Looks like it's threatening rain, but when has rain ever stopped us, right? Um, it's starting to happen. You can you can feel a little bit of uh, excitement building about the the reopening of of the state and. Uh, people are geared up for how they're going to reopen and, and all of those things. And um, feels like some folks are coming alive again, uh, like they've been zombies, but now they're coming back to, to life. Uh, there's a sermon in there somewhere, but uh, tonight's installment <laughs> is called The Crime Wave. Crime has seldom been a problem in my hometown except once during my teenage years when several houses were burglarized. The robbers would back their truck up to a house, load up, and drive away. During that same time, Norwood Roberts claimed to have been mugged outside the Elks Lodge, though it later turned out he had lost his money in a poker game, didn't want to tell his wife, so concocted a wild story about a hoodlum stealing his money. Still, all of this was enough to make us watch one another a little closer. It was during this period of paranoia that my father noticed a strange truck backed up to Mrs. Draper's house. Mrs. Draper was our widow neighbor and was visiting out of town. Dad called Charlie, our town's police officer. Charlie had been hoping for a lucky break in the case and hurried over to my dad's house to look the situation over. He parked his cruiser three doors down, slipped up to my parents' home, consulted with Dad, then inched over to Mrs. Draper's house, his holster unsnapped and his gun at the ready. Past the hedge, around the house, through the back door. Paused to listen. Heard a sound in the basement. Stealthed down the stairs, close to the wall so the steps wouldn't creak pitch dark. He saw a flashlight beam right past the furnace over by the laundry sink. Stealing a widow's washer and dryer. What is this world coming to? Charlie wondered. He saw a flash of metal, possibly a gun. He raised his pistol and fingered the trigger. Drop it, he ordered. I have a gun. So Frank, the town plumber, dropped his wrench. He would have yelled, but Frank's a steady man not prone to outbursts. Though lately Frank had been edgy, having heard about Norwood getting mugged and suspecting in a fatalistic kind of way that he was next on the list. Now here he was, down in a dark basement fixing pipes, Mrs. Draper two states away. They wouldn't find his body for days. What a way to go. Frank turned to, his, to face his attacker. Confront your danger like a man, his father had taught him. Go down, fight him. Frank, is that you? Charlie, what are you doing here? So Charlie told him, and they talked a little bit about Norwood and the crime wave, and wasn't it a shame, and did Charlie have any clues? Talked for nearly half an hour with my dad over on his front porch, wondering what in the world those robbers were doing to poor Charlie. He was just about to round up a posse when Frank and Charlie came out and stood by Frank's new truck, which Frank hadn't gotten around to painting his name on yet. Charlie never did find those robbers. The story going around was that someone from the city was picking us clean. When you live in a small town, it's tempting to blame every evil on ne'er-do-wells from the city. The alternative is believing one of your own did it, which is probably the case, but too painful to consider. Denial does a thriving business in the average small town. Like when Norwood's wife found his wallet in the mop bucket, which is where he had hidden it after the poker game. She never said a word, preferring ignorance over enlightenment. Easier to think he was mugged than face the truth that her gentle Norwood had a shadow side. This denial of our shadow side is understandable though most unhelpful. It's when we acknowledge our capacity for evil that we're better able to bring shadow into light. Truth is, we're a mixed bag people. Consider this. 
The King David, who struck up the band in praise to God, is the same David who killed a man after sleeping with his wife. The Saint Peter who wore martyr chains with joy is the same Peter who swore Jesus was a stranger. The kid who sacked your groceries and called you ma'am is the same kid who took your television. <laughs> Their condition is our condition. We practice goodness and we scurry after evil. Jekyll and Hyde, mixed bag. King David and Saint Peter and Sacker boy. <laughs> That's us. No denying it. Just ask Charlie. He'll confirm it. He knows our seamy side. Back in Danville, we still leave our doors unlocked. Though some days, we wish we hadn't. 99% of us you can trust. But watch out for that 1%. Depending on the day, it could be any one of us. God isn't finished with our town yet. We're not all saints. We each have our shadow side. And some of us linger there a little longer than we should. Concludes another edition of On the Porch with Pastor. A lot of truth in that story. You know, I think we grow up a lot as, as disciples of Christ when we realize no matter how bad someone seems, they're created in the image of God, and so there's some good in there. And no, how, no matter how saintly some of us may seem, we still are fallen, sinful human beings. And so there's a great capacity for evil still in there. And so maybe we should just pray that each other has days of goodness. <laughs> Almost said good days, but... That almost seems cliche to say, have a good day. Uh, might have to start saying, have a day of goodness. <laughs> Be good today. Um, choose to entertain the angelic voice that's speaking in our heads rather than the, the demonic voice that tries to lead us astray. With that, I want you to do me a kindness because I see myself in that story way too often. Uh, try as we do to let our lives look like Christ's. Um, I fall short way too often. So I'm going to pause for prayer and ask you, if you're watching, to pause with me and pray for me. And, uh, and then I'll pray for you. Father, as my friends are praying for me right now, I receive that prayer. I confess, Lord, that I need you more than I think I need you. I confess, Father, that I have failed you far too often, and I confess to you that I choose the unholy path way too easily sometimes. Forgive me. Cleanse me. And, Lord, just do with me what you want. <laughs> Help me to be the person you want me to be. And... Uh, when I get to heaven, we'll celebrate you because if I'm there at all, it'll be because of you. And we thank you for that. Lord, I pray for my friends. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to acknowledge their own sin, but also to acknowledge the goodness that's in them because of Christ. And Lord, that you would give us an awareness of ourselves that we wouldn't boast in our accomplishments, nor would we wallow excessively, excessively in our defeats, but that, Lord, we would dismiss ourselves altogether that we might exalt, exalt Christ better. And, Lord, we give you the praise for Christ's sake. Amen. Friends, we love you. We're glad. Thank you for praying with me. We're glad that you're here, and it, it is looking dark back over back over there <laughs> I've got this thing doing the opposite of what I'm doing um, just here's a little coaching moment for you <laughs> I'm going to keep this thing below 10 minutes but I just want to say when you're recording videos would you please record it so that when you're wearing a shirt or a sweater I can actually read it <laughs> sometimes I look at you guys you're all backwards 
And now I can see why you probably do it because I'm backwards. But anyway, we love you. Jesus is coming soon and eyes to the skies.